As I say, my name is Hao. Uh, I was a co-founder of BKML in 2011. And since then, we've been working in bringing uh, machine learning to the, to the people using APIs, using REST. And that's the, the thing I wanted to talk a bit about, the history of machine learning, and in particular, how machine learning and APIs are being brought together these days to make something bigger. So I'll start at the beginning. I'll start with the past, with a bit of history of how machine learning went. As you probably already know, machine learning was invented in order to win at checkers. Uh, in 1952, Arthur Samuel put it a bit nicely. He said that machine learning is a field of study that tries to make computers solve problems without actually telling them how to do that. Uh, we want the, the computer to, to learn how to, how to solve its own problems. And very early, uh, Thomas Watson, uh, Samuel's job uh, boss and, and the president and founder of IBM, uh, saw that there was something big going on and he bet that that, uh, that little uh, checker programs program will will rise will rise the price of IBM by 50 points and 15 sorry 15 points and actually it did he was right actually very 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 soon the, the field was picked first by academia people started studying the field people starting started making the theory making it a reality moving from traditional statistics to the new thing, they were the innovators. And in 1980, uh, the, the field became self-aware. It, 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 it was no longer a branch of statistics or anything like that. It was machine learning. The first workshop in Pittsburgh was in, in 1980. Uh, incidentally, our, our chief scientist was there. And I think it's the only one that was there that is still publishing stuff. It's been a long time. And then, well, from, from then on, we had this new field. It was machine learning. People started in the academia doing machine learning. And we see a typical, a typical shift in the focus as time passes, right? So the field started with, with new algorithms and theory, people inventing, uh, inventing the stuff, studying how to do machine learning, what were the, 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 the algorithms. You should have heard about uh, many of them. Then as time passes, uh, we, the, the, focus, the focus shifts uh, uh, towards, OK, I have these models now. Let's study how to fine tune them. What are the good parameters? How do I, they, do I apply them? Or what things do I need to change when I move from one set of data to another? Time passes, and focus keeps moving. And, and then we come back to, to inventing new algorithms or to fine tune or to combine uh, previous ones. And, and you see things like automated representation, which these days goes by the name of uh, deep learning. I'm sure you, you've heard of that. Or composability. You, find, you try to find new ways of combining, combining all, all ways, all solutions to give you more power, like, like decision trees, right? You combine lots of trees in an ensemble. You invent things like bugging, like boosting, things like that. And only very, very, very recently, the focus has started to move again, and people has started to realize that what's missing, what is probably still missing is applicability, deployability. OK, I have all these nice algorithms. I know how to combine them. I know how to fine tune them. Uh, how do I really put those algorithms? How do I really put the field into practice? How do I bring machine learning to the real world? This was put very recently in a very strong way, for instance, by, by, by Kiri uh, Wastaf. In 2012, in a nice, in a nice uh, paper, where she put it blind, he put it, she put it very bluntly. He said, "Machine learning is only as good as the impact it makes on the real world." And in, in, in her article, she, she's emphasizing that okay, we've, we've been focusing in the field in learning, in the learning st stage of a of a of a machine learning application, in how to build the model. I have the data. I want to learn from the data. I want to represent it as a model. But creating a real, a useful machine learning application involves many other stages that uh, ha had been neglected so far in, in, in the field because it wasn't mainly an academic uh, enterprise. So you have all these other, other details, other tasks that need to be addressed 
to make a real, a real uh, machine learning application. So up to, up, to, up to a few years ago, yeah, everybody was doing machine learning that was doing what machine learning was focusing on, on learning, on training the model, and making tools for, for making that as flexible and as powerful and, and as fun as, as, you could as you could imagine. But there are other things to do. For instance, what happens in, if I want to put that model, which is very nice to practice, if I want to make that useful, usually making that useful means uh, making it able to, to predict things. So how do, what do I need to do once I have the model to serve uh, a million users? And what if, I mean, I don't want to, to, wait, uh, to wait five years or one year or even six months to have a model. What if I need a model per day for a million users? Or maybe if I'm, if I'm in real time, what if I need 10 models per hour for one million users. And what about the predictions? Should I wait like, like two hours for the predictions or do I need them because I'm, I'm at the bank and, and, and I need to make a quick decision? So those are issues that need to be addressed and that the legacy machine learning tools that had been developed over the years from, from the pioneering work in, in Weka to can, can I learn, scikit learn, all these tools, all these libraries are still focused on the learning task, on applying the very specific, the very scientific uh, endeavor to software. I'm, I'm being, and what's the problem with, with, with that endeavor? Well, it's, it's, it's worth it, but, but it has many problems, right? This is, those are legacy tools and libraries that, that are made for scientists by scientists. So they speak the language of scientists. Uh, they concentrate on algorithms. You have algorithms galore, but little attention to many other aspects that are needed. They are, they are for research, so from the software engineering point of view, they are kind of toys, right? They work in, in, in a desktop, if you don't have Linux. They work in, 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 in single thread mode. They work for small, small data. They are not thought to scale from the software engineering point of view. They are, they, they are not really ready for that. And on the one hand, they are, they are very complicated. They talk the, the very specific language of, of the models of machine learning. A developer won't be able to, to easily understand them. That on the one hand. And at the same time, on the other hand, they are oversimplified because they are dealing with data that is, for example, is for research. You don't, you don't care about the real world needs of my, my data has no structure. I have to, to, to trim words. I have to do lots of tasks that don't that are not the focus of, of researchers. So they, they, have all, they suffer from, from all these problems. And that's still, I'm being a bit provocative here, admittedly, but I would even say that post Hadoop, in the post Hadoop era with the, with the nice frameworks and Mahout and things like Spark, they address some of the problems, but not at all all of the problems, especially not the, not the excess of, algorithm, of algorithms and not the lack of a language that's addressed, of tools that are addressed, more to practitioners, more to developers than to than to to really specialists in 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 machine learning and sometimes in 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 distributed systems. So I will still label these newer frameworks and, and tools legacy. And of course, this is on the open. I've been talking of tools that that you can find in open source in the open source and academia world. If you go to the to the commercial offerings, it's they have exactly the same problem. And moreover, they cost a lot of money. So you won't find a solution to these problems on commercial tools of, the, of, the, of, the, of that period of time. This, this, this probably the, 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 the most outstanding problem with the legacy tools is just another manifestation of the, of the paradox of choice that we in software engineering have been calling the analysis paralysis for many years, right? That you have too many, so much, so many so choices that you don't really know what to do. You don't, you, you don't really, you are not really able to, to pick a, a good solution. And most of the time, what's more, that's been even recognized by academia itself in some papers like this one here. Most of the time, the exact algorithm that you need, that you use, it's not that important. There are many of them. There are 200 ways of classifying. But it's really, do you really need 200 ways or do you really need to think very hard and choose one of the 200 ways or do all 200 ways and pick the best? 
Not really. If you, if you do real analysis on real data, you most of the time find that you can easily uh, pre-select one or two algorithms that's go that are going to be good enough. We don't need all the complication that's there. And uh, one thing that reflects that, that the problem was actually there is that by the turn of the century, uh, the wall out there, the, the non war, the non-specialist world, like the economists and, and people like that, were already talking about the data deluge. And we, have, we are going to have lots of data. We are going to have a data-driven uh, decision process. We should take advantage of that. And at the same time, there was all this machine learning stuff, very sophisticated stuff. Where are the, um, five years after that, where were the, the, the smarter applications? Did you see any? Not that much, really. Uh, people were not using that. We have all this data. Where is the application the lash associated with the data the lash? We didn't have that. And I would claim that the, the problem, that the main problem was the paradox of choice, was the, the non-specialist, oh, sorry, the two specialized language that machine learning and machine learning and legacy machine learning tools were still talking. And the thing that was, that was stopping the appearance of more and more uh, applications using machine learning was the, the gap between the language talked by the utilities for machine learning and the language talked by, by developers, who, as you know, need a way of abstracting problems. We need problems in real life are too complicated to go to the details and to write a paper for, for each problem that you want to solve. You need abstraction. And when it comes to abstracting, well, here I will be preaching to the choir, but what we do or the tool that we found that, that really works well for abstracting are APIs and REST APIs. Actually, APIs came first, right, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the 2000s, pioneering work by, by Salesforce, people, companies like Salesforce, eBay, a bit later, Amazon, started realizing that services must be, must be made available to, to developers through API over a well-defined interface those were the days when, when XML was supposed to, to cure cancer, to do everything, to be the solution to all problems, and they were, used, uh, they were using initially XML. That fortunately passed, and, and, and thanks to the, to the, to the war, uh, among, among others, of Roy Fielding in defining or inventing uh, race interfaces, we started to see with the, with, the, with the Flickr was probably one of the first uh, big scale services providing REST JSON-based APIs in the in, in 2004, we started to see REST APIs. And then, okay, we had that old problem, machine learning, we need to abstract over that, we need to, to focus, we need to start talking about solving problems more than, than, than how to, to enrich the, 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 the world of algorithms. And we have this new way that works very well, the REST APIs of abstracting over, over not only over problems, but also over infrastructure, over things like that. So the, 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 the time for applying our solution to that old problem and to go beyond the legacy tools we were talking about had come. And yeah, in 2010, probably uh, Google Prediction API, they were the first guys to put together APIs and all the lore in, in machine learning. Uh, in 2011, uh, Everybody, the general public, became aware of machine learning in a big way, thanks to, to Watson and, and Geopardy. We were there starting BigML that started as a company, AP First, and, and we were already in that mindset. And as, as we were, there were a lot of other little companies fully aware that that was the way and trying to make something about it. And then it came a period, I think, where um, that we call the Hadoop and big data craziness. To us, during that period, Hadoop was the new XML. If you, it seemed as if you, if you wanted a company that was going to do something in the cloud, uh, was doing machine learning or whatever else, it was in the cloud, it, it had to, in the cloud, it had to scale. It was a Hadoop company. It was a bit worrying because, at least to me, it seemed like, okay, wh what are you doing? I'm doing Hadoop. And it sounded just like, what are you doing in the, in the 2000s, right? I, I'm doing XML. But what for? I don't know. It's XML. And, and, and then with Hadoop, there's been a couple of three years that it, it's been a, a, a bit like that. No, I'm doing Hadoop. No, but what's your problem? What do you want to solve? Uh, fortunately, I think we are maturing 
uh, more, uh, more quickly than, than back in the day. And we are already, after this craziness, craziness realizing that Hadoop is a tool. And it can be a valid tool or a not so valid tool. I happen to think that for machine learning is not that good. But it's not the point. The point is that you can or, 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 or may not be using it. But what we are trying to solve are machine learning problems with this new tool using, using APIs. And that's been uh, realized, of course, not only by, by us, but, but also by the big players. You know that Azure, uh, Microsoft entered the game a year ago. Uh, two or three weeks ago, Amazon also presented uh, its API. In 2014, we started, Louis here, somewhere here, uh, uh, wrote the, one of the first books on the, on the, on the field. So we are, we are back to centering on the, on the problem at hand and not only on the, on the tools. And well, uh, you, you already know that we are starting as an, as an industry, as a, an industrial field to have conference and, and, and to offer and to talk about the domain and, and, the, and the problems we want to solve. So we are there. We are here, actually. We are in the present. And, and with the, the, new, the new companies, that, the ones that they started a few years ago, the, the, one that, the big ones that, that are starting today, you can already do lots of things with machine learning thanks to the power brought to you by APIs. Uh, here you have a, a bit of a summary of some of the main, main advantages or, or main strengths of this combination of, of, uh, of APIs and machine learning. I mentioned most of them already. Probably the most important is that we found a way of abstracting over the machine learning problems, over the specialization, and we are talking the language that developers understand. We are giving them, thanks to the APIs, the ways to automate the way to talk about the, the problems they want to solve and not about the problems academy, academia or the machine learning problems uh, want, want to solve. And at the same time, very importantly, the APIs are also helping and a lot in, in managing the, the, the infrastructure headaches associated with providing a service, making your little algorithm, nice algorithm available to those 20 million users that want their predictions now or maybe yesterday. So they are helping with that. And in that way, we are, we are, closing, we are closing the gap between that we saw in, in legacy applications between creating the models and making this, this nice representation of the data and putting it to use. The gap between learning and, uh, and scoring or, or, or predicting. So, and, and that's, that's already easy to see that this is working. You can, you can go and using just an API, you can do things as sophisticated. Today, you can do things as sophisticated as, as predicting charm in a, in a company, helping quality assurance in, in an engineering company, uh, helping the, the, your sales team uh, take decisions. Uh, next generation, I would say, uh, personalization systems that use real machine learning to customize the, the look and feel of, a, of a, and the offering of your websites, you name it. There are lots of things that, that you can do and in, a very, in a very easy and direct way. Let me, let me give you quickly an, an example of something that you can do with an API. I happen to know this BigML API uh, well, so I will use that very quickly. A task that wouldn't have been possible a few years ago and that you can today uh, do perform with a few easy steps is, for instance, anomaly detection. You have lots of data and you want to pinpoint the points in your data that are special. Thing of fraud detection, of, of quality assurance, the things that are going to, that are going not well, that are different. Uh, these days you just could write an application using an API. You are all familiar with APIs. You could go and, and if you are like me, use bash and, and become a line write a few, a few calls uh, to CURL and create, and create your anomaly detector and use that for real, in the real world, with big data, all in the cloud. You know, that's, that's the power brought to you by, by, by APIs. And moreover, yeah, that's, that's still a bit messy, right? Because I'm, I have here to define, um, to go to the command line and define environment vari variables and, and all that, but yeah, you already know that I can go once I have the means to abstract, I can go up the abstraction layer. And of course, the, first, the next thing I will do is to use a higher level language, to use a binding. 
and, 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 and program it nicely so that I, I, I start speaking about the, the domain, right? And write uh, direct things like, okay, let's create a source, let, let's create a data set, let's create an anomaly detector, and now let's, let's instantiate the, the detector locally and use it locally. Here, yeah, here we are creating a very complicated model that's called isolation forest. That means that it's creating uh, 120 and 28, uh, 120, sorry, 128 trees underneath. It's combining them. It's doing, it's doing that at the scale. It's probably fetching my data from I don't know where, and it's giving me an answer here. But all I'm talking about when I write this program is about, oh, create my data set. This is my data. I want an anomaly detector. I want to, you to tell me what are the 10 most anomalous, anomalous points there. I've extracted all these things from the academic stuff passing through all the scaling, all the Amazon clusters, everything that's needed is hidden here. And I'm, I'm not making this up. This, this is big wars today, and not only with, with our platform. And of course, once you have that, you can go yet another, another ladder up the level of abstraction and just talk about your problem. Just, for instance, this is a command line interface that lets you just write one line and say, what I want is to find anomalies in this data set, not even do this step and this step and this step. I want just the anomalies. So I write a tool that, that talks the highest level uh, language possible. So the, the presence of, of machine learning APIs is, is improving. It's already quite good, actually, if you go and, and try to compare them and to say what they do in APIs that we have just today, you'll find a lot of aspects, a lot of access uh, that you will need to, to draw comparisons. And one, one thing that, that we will benefit from is, is the appearance, because we are not there yet, the appearance of new ways or more ways of benchmarking, of comparing the offers to let us decide what we need. A very good example was again by Louis in the first talk today. He started, he started to, to, to draw real comparisons between what you have there. Back in the day, we had a few also, a few, a few blog posts about that. More of that is needed, and I think that's very important, an aspect that's very important in, in these APIs that will help also comparing them is that we are bringing to you democratization of machine learning. All these platforms, I don't know if, if any of them is still not doing that, but they will anyway, is free for the try. You can go there, you, you have very, very low barrier of entry, you don't have to pay anything, you don't have to put your, your credit card, you just use them. So that's democratizing. Machine learning is no longer for experts. It's not even longer. It's not even no longer for 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 programmers. Is if we provide the right tools and make them open enough, people will go and write those benchmark, benchmarks for you. For that, it's very important to us that that what you these platforms, what these platforms uh, provide, and think that's already an issue that's on the table, is that they provide uh, transparency and exportability enough to make that useful for everyone and to make it easy to, to, trade, to trade off between them. Some, some, some of them, some of the platform, platforms nowadays, just like the Google Prediction API, won't give you any kind of exportability, right? You put there your data, and you send your data, and you get an answer. It's a black box. You don't have neither the model nor the, the you don't know how it's applied to your data. Things can get a bit better in, in places like Amazon or, or Azure, where you can actually see the models that, that, that have been created. You at least, well, you paid for that. You put your data there. You need to know how your results look like. But you still, if you need to use that models, which remember is, is the whole point. Using the models, it's very nice to have nice models, but I want to use them. You still have to go there. You cannot, you cannot use these models that you can now see. You cannot use them outside the platform. That is, we feel that that's still a problem. We, we, if we really want democratic machine learning, and if you really want the value for the money you put there, you need to go to, to models that are fully transparent. This, those are your models, and you can bring them with you wherever you want and make able to use them in any platform. They are used for the taking. You pay for them. So the future, in the future, what, what we think we are, we are these trends are, are, are going to continue, with, I think, uh, anecdotically, a year ago when, when Azure started, it, was, it didn't have an API. You had to go with a fancy, uh, a fancy uh, graphical interface, put a human there, and draw boxes, blah, blah, blah. That's not going to happen 
anymore, I think. If you provide a service, API first. Otherwise, people can go and on top of your API, build all the fanciness that you need or that you want, but you need to start with the API. In the meantime, uh, Azure has corrected that and, and they, they have a, an API now. Another, another push, another, another trend that is going to, to, to grow stronger is, and stronger is a push for simplicity. These days, you still, in some, in some places, you still have to go and say, oh, I want to solve this problem. I, will, I want to make a prediction. And they will ask you, oh, is this a classification or a regression problem? Mm, it's a classification. OK, next step. Do you have a, a, a two-class or multi-class problem? Oh, I have three classes. This, this must be a multi-class. Oh, right, fine. We'll do that. And now, please choose one of these 250 algorithms that we have available to solve that problem. Come on. I'm, I'm, first of all, isn't, isn't this machine learning? Do I have to tell you, I'm giving you the data, do I have to tell you what the type of my data is, whether it's multi-class or not, whether it's a regression? Come on, infer it for yourself. You are the, the expert. And what about the algorithm? All I want to know is, is to predict this, this flower species. I, I, don't tell me about trees or boosting. We, we are going to see a push towards, today it's already possible to do what you see here to your right. You click. You get your data, you predict. You forget about the details. That's what the, 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 the service provide, provides. We are not there yet for everyone, but we will. Um, also, programmability. We are already doing some of that. We are going to see more and more of that. Yesterday, someone was emphasizing that uh, in, in a talk. We, we, are, we, we had to go to thinner and thinner clients. Nowadays, it's already possible to do very thin or uh, uh, reasonably uh, thin clients, like, like the, the example of the anomaly detector, you have a few steps, you program them, and then you talk with the server uh, in each step, right, with REST calls and progress towards the, the, the solution. What's going to happen is that these steps are going to be produced more and more. You will have your program, you will have the specification of your program, the way of doing that, and say the server, go and do that for me. It's, if you will, is a bit of the mobile code of of, of, of a few years ago we were talking about. Um, so so it's, it's more than model. I, I tell the server to solve the problem for me, for me. The server will take care of parallelizing the things or assigning resources of knowing what's the best strategy to, to realize the, 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 the solution to the problem I'm, I'm, I'm asking. And freedom, yeah, I, I just talked about that. I just talked about the importance of, of exportability. Another aspect of freedom that will be very important is importability. It's not only important that I can export my models, that, but also that I can bring my data from very heterogeneous sources to the place where I want to use it. It won't work anymore, that thing that some, some, some people do of, oh, you want to analyze your data, first put it in my platform, which happens to be the, the, the same platform that is performing the, the machine learning, right? No, you, you should be able to, to bring your data from very different places and the dual of that is in the same way that you want many, many heterogeneous places in one place to process that, you also want your data, once it's in one place, to, in one place to be processed by many APIs, many different APIs. So it's going to be very important that APIs are composable, that you can call them together, that you can make them collaborate to solve your problem. No, no, no just a uh, monolithic platform that is doing everything for you. You should be able to combine them. Here is, 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 is an example of the Al Alchemy API, guys. So we just that, an example of how, of how you can nowadays already combine different APIs. There, there's going to be a push for that, and it's going to be important to, to be able to do that. We will see specialization. You, you will stop uh, talking about, about, about machine learning and start talking about real problems and providing APIs solving problems like determining your age with, with more or less success, but you will start talking about problems and the, and the domain specific, in the domain-specific language of the problem, not about my trees or about my anomaly detector, not even that. You, you build on top of that and, and, and have an API for fraud detection, an API for lead scoring, and so on and so forth. There are so many examples that will come forth. In the end, as Tushar Chandra in Google was saying last year, uh, Machine learning will become just another layer that you will take for granted in your applications, that you will use without giving it a second thought. 
just in the same way that, for instance, you use a, data, a database nowadays. You don't care about uh, file systems, about logs, about e not even indexing, about distributing the, 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 the load of your data or your database. No, you ask using SQL, and there's a layer that, that abstracts for you. That's where we are going with machine learning. Well, machine learning will be there for you for the taking without being something uh, taken for granted. We expect even some kind of standardization going on. Probably in the way that TCP IP standardized uh, the network layer, for instance, and the fact of standardization is what I would expect. And finally, you want the pipe dream. But we are, we are nailing there the, the, the point that where I just define my data model from the onset at the beginning as something that has a field that's predictable. I don't care about services or anything. It's just like I have persistent fields, like, right, for instance, I now have this, this model. I create the model in Django, for instance, and I say, oh, this flag that is telling me if, if this guy is, 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 is a delinquent, make that predictable. That's the ultimate transparent machine learning model that we want. So the conclusion is, again, what I've been talking about all this time. I think that in the end, this match of REST APIs and machine learning, these services that are right now here and that will be evolving in these ways are going to, to help us developing small applications that are easier, faster, and much cheaper. And that will impact productivity of everyone here in the room. And also even as the economist was saying that last year, it will even impact the way our society is, is structured in the same way that car assembly lines or automation lines destroy it older ways of organization. That's it. For Thank you. Well, thank you. Really great presentation. Yeah, uh, really wide. We have time for a few questions there. You go. Hi. Um, I just tried out um, um, for a few minutes uh, your, your tools, and one question is, it seems that everything is really based on decision trees. Is this correct? And, and if so, why, why did you decide for that approach? Is that just because it can incrementally learn performance? And can you maybe also give a few examples where it won't work very well, just to get an estimation? I de several reasons. Well, first, not everything is, uh, these days, not everything is decision trees. For instance, we have clustering, which is unsupervised, an unsupervised model. A normal detector uses a special kind of random forest uh, below, but it's not a pure decision tree. So we are growing that. But the idea, but yeah, initially, the main drive was first addressing the paradox, the paradox of choice thing. We, we had these, all these hundreds and hundreds of algorithms. We wanted to find the best ones, the good enough ones. And uh, the good enough ones are, there are studies, academic studies that show that trees are good enough in most cases. A nice property of trees is that they are always on the top percentile of accuracy in most problems. There are, for every problem, you can find something that's, that's better than a decision tree. But we are, we, we are talking about a horizontal here, so we need something that, that, that scales well in that, in, that, in that sense. Another key aspect of trees is that they are understandable. They are depictable. I mean, if, if, you, are, uh, if you are predicting that a guy has cancer, you better give him a way of feeling sure that, uh, oh, this is, an, uh, this is a black box, like a, 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 a neural network. I put your inputs there, and it says it's cancer, but like, that doesn't feel, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's, we wanted to, to bring my children to people, so that was a, a, a good way. So, so we, we try to, to, to focus on that, to give, for each kind of problem we want to solve, to find a good algorithm and give the best solution. For classification and regulation, it was decision trees. For clustering, we have uh, our own way of, uh, one algorithm that works well enough for anomaly detection, uh, we found a good one that happens to be using trees also underneath, but that's, if you, if you like anecdotal, it's not because it's using trees, it's because it's the best one that we found, and so on and so forth. Yeah, one last question here. Uh, one of the problems, uh, or challenges rather, um, that we face is the 
locality of the data. Obviously, data brings affinity, and you want to keep the com computation close to data. So what, what has been your experience in terms of um, tackling that, you know, providing kind of services in that terms, and uh, what is your, your view? My feeling is that, is that nowadays it's not a big problem. It's, it's not the problem that it used to be. Uh, it used to be hard to move data around, and uh, these, day, these days networks and, and, and connectivity is, is getting better and better. And for most of the, our, our customers right now, it's no problem to bring the data to, to Amazon, for instance, or to any cloud provider. And once you have the, the data there, it's, it's, it's done. You have no problems of locality. You have many ways of, of bringing data to, 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 the, to, the, to the processes. And that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is that you also find is that if, if you are clever enough and provide the platform that's, that you can put inside on premises for some people, that helps too. There's people that simply, it's not about moving the data. It's that not, not about the bandwidth or the difficulty of moving the data. It's that they have policies that don't allow them to move the data from their premises. So you have to be, and that's not going to, you, you, you are not going to have a strategy, oh, that way is easier, you put that data. No, they say no. But the same guys that say no have big resources on premises. So you have to have a platform that can go and be put there. And then the problem goes away again. So my feeling is that these days it's not really the, the big problem it used to be. They don't tell it. Yeah. How? Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you.